As we approach the second half of Numbers 20, this it follows right behind the rebellion of not only the children of Israel due to the lack of water. This is 40 years after departing from Egypt. The second generation, they went through the very same test and they failed the same test that their, their parents failed back at the first, uh, what I call Meribah 1.0. The first time they strove with Moses over the lack of water, they called that place Meribah. And now they call this place Meribah. So I call this one Meribah 2.0. Because the second generation failed the very same test. But what's remarkable about this one is Moses acted remarkably at the first one and obeyed the Lord and the Lord was honored. And that picture and type of Christ as the rock that was smitten to give that life-giving water the living water. That was fulfilled there in, in Exodus 17. But here in Numbers 20, Moses rebelled against the Lord as well. And he and Aaron, they did not, as we saw this morning, it wasn't about who God was. It wasn't God's message and it wasn't God's abilities that were in focus. Moses drew the attention to himself. And for that, he and Aaron both were refused entrance into the promised land. Well, Verse 14 leads us to the events that came just after that. And they're at Kadesh. And at Kadesh they are looking, Moses is thinking, okay, let's, it's time to move on into the promised land and get these people headed in that direction, even though he knows now that there, there's no way he's going in. Well, ver, verse 14, it says, And Moses sent messengers from Kadesh, to the king of Edom. You see, Edom was a territory that, that was between them and the promised land. And to pass through Edom, they wanted just, there was, a, there was a king's highway, which is a finished main road that went through that territory. This is what trade caravans and military troops would use to go through a territory. And it's not uncommon practice to send a request and even offer a payment for safe passage, rather than have to go all the way around that territory. Number one, you don't have roads. And number two, it's, it's difficult with a large crowd like that, the terrain and different part, things like that. So they sent this to, the, to Edom, the king of Edom. But you need to stop and think. Look at the first phrase there in their formal request that is sent. This is a different, we don't know if it was a letter that Moses wrote and sent by messengers or if it was an oral message, but it has every element with the exception of the introduction and conclusion, which are assumed, every element of a diplomatic request from one leader to another. But the first phrase says, thus saith thy brother Israel. Now, what does he mean by this? You know, some people today say, oh, you're my brother. You're it's just kind of a personal identification with someone. But th this is more than that. And to understand what's going on here. Remember some of those passages back in Genesis? We said, why did the Lord give us all these names and all these peoples and all these details? And they're not all of them, by the way. It's just the ones that were relevant to context for the children of Israel to understand what they would face as they entered the promised land. So we told you, tuck those in the back of your hat because when you go, continue your reading of Scripture and the history unfolds, you're going to see how those names and those relationships and those origins come to become relevant as the Word of God is, it was revealed. Now go back with me to Genesis. We're going to start there in Genesis chapter 25. And I want to give you some context to what's going on here at Edom. Now this, this passage, at first glance you say, well, there's really nothing here. You know, it's just one of those things you just read over and keep moving on, get to a passage that has more substance. But I believe as we study these things, there are things here that we want to learn, but also principles that can be applied. But in Genesis chapter 25, we're not going to read these. We're just, I'm just going to refer them to you, and you go back and read these, refresh your memory from our study of Genesis. 
later on. Genesis 25, Esau sells his birthright for basically a, a bowl of lentil soup. He came in, he was starving, and I gotta tell you, lentil soup is delicious. I, I'd eat a lot of that when I'm in the Middle East. It is delicious. I'm not sure I'd sell my birthright over it, but Esau did. And of course, so there in chapter 25, he sells his birthright. Over in chapter 27, Jacob, I mean, Isaac is going to bless Esau, his firstborn. There were twins, but Esau was born first. Well, of course, Esau was not God's chosen one, obviously. But God would have done it his way. He's not endorsing the deception that took place. So Isaac says before, he says, he says, son, I want you to go out and I want you to kill that animal and prepare that meat that I love just so the way you do it. And then you come and then I'm going to bless you and I'm going to die. Well, he goes out while he's hunting. Rebecca calls Jacob and says, hey. This is what's going on. He says, what I want you to do is I want you to go and get this for me, and I'm going to prepare the meat, and you go and you wrap some, some uh, animal skin around your arm to where you'll, look, you'll feel as hairy as Esau. He was a mountain man, and Jacob, he was, as one preacher put it, said he was a mama's boy. So they deceived Isaac into blessing him, and when Esau comes in and brings this, his father says, what's going on? He says, I've already blessed you. You know the story. In chapter 28, Esau, Jacob is told to flee to Laban's house in Paden Aram. And he said, you go up there and under the guise of you need to find a wife. Don't choose a wife from the people here. You go up there and find one from people that are kin to us. So he flees to Paden Aram. And, of course, between 28 and 33... You know, all the things, all of Jacob's deception are, are returned to him in kind from his father-in-law Laban. Well, chapter 33, Jacob is returning. And do you remember his fear as he's returning and he's coming through this land? He knows in the back of his mind, well, his mother's dead. He will never see her again. That was one of the things he longed for, to see his wives and his children and but she was dead. All their scheming. That family, Isaac's family, was one of the most dysfunctional families and scandal-ridden families I've ever seen. But he's coming back, and, but in the back of his mind is, my brother Esau is going to hear that I'm coming. And he's still afraid. What's going to happen after all these years? What is he going to do to me? Well, chapter 33, we see Jacob scheming. He takes his least favorite of the handmaidens that bore children for him. He puts those two out in front with their children and gifts, sheep and other things like that, flocks, as gifts to Esau. And then he comes to the second least favorite wife and then to Leah and her children. And finally you have Rebecca and her children. And here's Jacob way back in the back. Now you talk about hiding behind somebody's apron or something like that. He, this is not the picture of a provider and of a, a man who's taking care of his family. But as Esau's coming by and he's seeing, okay, what's this? And all these gifts and this and all these gifts. And so it comes to verse 8 or so. And, and they, in fact, don't, don't start at verse 8. What I love is verse 4. Verse 3, they, they finally meet each other. They, he comes through all this caravan of people and animals. And Esau gets to Jacob and it says, verse 3 of chapter 33 of Genesis. And he passed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. And Esau, look at this. Can you imagine Jacob scared for his life? And here's this burly mountain man. Red as all get out. Apparently his hair was red. His skin seemed red and everything. And he comes up to him and says he ran to meet him and he embraced him. And he fell on his neck and he kissed him. And they wept. Have you ever had a situation where you dreaded facing a person because you knew that there was some offense between you and you just put it off and put it off and when the moment comes your heart rate goes up, your breathing gets short and you just 
you start to literally shake because you don't know how this is going to go down. Well, imagine all that Jacob had done to his brother Esau. And here, the response that he sees is his brother runs and embraces him. And then I like what he says. Look at, look at over. And well, just continue reading because this is verse 5. And he lifted up his eyes and saw the women and the children and said, Who are those with thee? And he said, The children which God hath graciously given thy servant. Then the handmaidens came near and their children and they bowed themselves. And Leah also with her children came near and bowed themselves. And after came Joseph near and Rachel and they bowed themselves. Can, can you imagine to me? Hey, meet my family. Now, this is another family that kind of goes in the Guinness World Book of Records as far as being strange. He married one, found out it was not the one he had agreed upon. And then he marries the sister, and of course, their jealousy over who gave birth first, they, he ends up having children through the handmaidens as well. So he's introducing all of these to Esau. But then I like Esau says, What meanest thou by all this drove which I met? What, what's all these gifts you've been sending to me? And he, he, goes, he says, These are to find grace in, thy, in the sight of my Lord. And Esau, I like this, he said, I have enough, my brother. Keep thou what thou hast unto thyself. I don't need your junk. I've got enough junk of my own. All the things that he had anticipated, all the things that he had been afraid of, rather than handling things in an honorable biblical way, he, uh, he, he acted as a coward. And he acted out of fear. And, of course, here you see how God had prepared both of these to... To meet again. But that's not the end of the story. And you notice what happens. He, he, he insists that he take these. And, and, and I guess Esau accepted them. But then he says in verse 12. And he said let us take our journey. And let us go. And I will go before thee. Esau's offering protection. And to help them. And Jacob says to him. My Lord knoweth that the children are tender. And the flocks and herds and young men are with me. And if men should overdrive them one day, all the flock will die. He said, we can't keep up with you and your men. So we're going to have to go slower. So he said, let my Lord, I pray thee, pass over before his servant, and I will lead on softly according as the cattle that goeth before me and the children be able to endure until I come unto my Lord unto Seir. See, that's where Esau had settled and where they settled, Esau was basically saying, hey, you're going to come stay with me for a while. Now, inviting him over is not a small thing. Look at all the people he had and all this entourage and all the cattle and all those things that he brought from Paden Aram with him. But Esau was offering him hospitality. He said, what does this have to do with Edom? We'll get there. Verse 15, and Esau said, okay, let me leave with thee, some of the flock that are folk that are with me, some of my helpers. And he says, they'll, they'll help you along. This. He said, you don't need to do that. Let me find grace in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way into Seir. And Jacob journeyed, where? To Succoth. That means tents. He didn't go to Seir. He had agreed. He says, you go on ahead and we'll come. We're going to come slower. You, you go on ahead. Just be, we're going to come. We're going to come see you. And the Bible does not record that he ever went to see his brother. After all of this and after all these events, he didn't go because he still felt that he could not be trusted. Well, you see in, in chapter 35, you see the death of Isaac in the last verse of chapter 35 says, And Isaac gave up the ghost and died and was gathered unto his people, being old and full of days. And his sons, Esau and Jacob, buried him. We don't have a record that they had met each other again between the time they met on the way as he was coming back down to the promised land and from that day until the day that Isaac died. How much time transpired, I don't, know, don't remember for sure, but... They saw each other at the funeral where they buried their father. 
But then you don't hear it. But this, the next chapter gives us a whole chapter on the descendants of Esau. And what, who were the descendants of Esau? Well, look, look there in chapter 36. And verses 1 and following tells us, These are the generations of Esau who is, what? Edom. And you go on reading down, starts to give his generations, verse 8, Thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir, Esau is Edom. And it goes on, verse 9, and says, And these are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites. Now you remember many times throughout the Old Testament, Israel is re referred to as Jacob as well as, as Israel because God changed Jacob's name from deceiver, Jacob, to Israel, the prince. So here you have Jacob and Esau meeting again. Now jump forward about 500 years. Because from the time that happened, there was some time between there and when they descended down to Egypt. Probably maybe more than 50 years, but add 50 years or so there. Then 400 years they were in Egypt. And then add 40 years in the desert. You're talking at least 500 years from the time, once again, Jacob let his brother down. And this meeting in, on their wilderness journey. So you come back to Numbers chapter 20, and you have this context of these two brothers, Israel and Edom, or Jacob and Esau. Now obviously they're not alive, but their descendants are. And these offenses, they transpire from generation to generation. In the Middle East, you're going to find they have very long memories and very long grudges. Well, so we come back to chapter 20. And with that in mind, understand, this is not just a simple encounter of two strangers. But this is indeed a, it's a meeting of two peoples that were at odds with each other. And there is an offense between them that has been festering for 500 years. And what was just a simple, everyday, common request? turned into something that, they were, that was totally denied. Now, before we read the passage, I'm going to give you two other questions I want you to keep in your mind as we read this account. Number one, where was the cloud? How was Israel going and which way were they going? The cloud directed the way. When the cloud arose and went forward, they followed. Wherever it went, they went. But as there was camped there at Kadesh, Moses, again, sends, sends messengers ahead. Here's another thing I don't see in this passage. Nowhere in this passage did it, it's silent as to anything the Lord told them to do. Everywhere else, the word of the, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying this, do this. And the Lord spake unto Moses, do this. You know, just like we saw this morning, Moses was acting on his own, his own actions, his own message, his drew, drew attention to himself. Uncharacteristic, from Exodus 3 when he was called to this service until now, we have not seen this behavior on the part of Moses. And here we are seeing something that it, it screams out from the text because what should have been just a simple thing, why is it included in the passage? Okay, they didn't get to go through Edom, they went around it. Big deal. No, it is a pretty big deal because it spells out even the diplomatic communications between the two peoples. But also what screams out to me from this passage is the silence on the part of God through this. Now everywhere else God led them, I mean if he led them through the Red Sea, he parted the Red Sea to take a cross on it, on, on dry ground. And then he closed it upon their enemies. God had already promised them to deliver their enemies in their hands. Why? Would they try this this way? And once again, it seems as though Moses is saying this. You know, these are family. The Edomites, they're our brothers, going all the way back to our fathers, Jacob and Esau. And I believe we can handle this on our own. They use their own reasoning, their own rationale, and their own methods. And these were worldly methods because this, what I'm going to read to you next, 
is a standard, classic, diplomatic communication between two heads of state. Now, assumed in this is the greed, the introduction, it's saying, the, you know, Moses, the leader of the children of Israel, to the king of Edom. But it's, it's assumed in the first part of verse 14 of chapter 20 of Numbers. And Moses sent messengers unto Kadesh, unto the king of Edom, thus saith thy brother Israel. So it starts with an introduction, and that's assumed. But then the next step in this diplomatic letter is a statement of the past relationship. And this is what he does. Thus saith thy brother Israel. Going all the way back to Jacob and Esau. Hey, our people, they're twins. But they were not twins. Because the blessing that God placed upon Jacob, they were the chosen seed through whom the Messiah would come. And that chosen people. And Esau was rejected. Hence the statement over in Romans, God loved Jacob and he hated Esau. This had nothing to do with love or hate in an in emotional sense as we attribute it, or that God doomed Esau to hell and Jacob to heaven through predestination. That's not what that verse is saying. What it's saying is for his purpose as choosing a nation through whom the Messiah would come, he, loved ja he chose Jacob and he refused Esau, the, which went against the culture. You would always choose the firstborn, not the secondborn. And God, over and over and over, as we have seen, chooses the younger over the older. Well... Look at this. So, first of all, the statement of the past relationship. Thus saith thy brother Israel, thou knowest. Now, he's going to give a historical setting in their present circumstances. Thou knowest all the travail that hath befallen us, how our fathers went down into Egypt, and we have dwelt in Egypt a long time, and the Egyptians vexed us and our fathers. And when we cried unto the Lord, he heard our voice. And sent an angel, and hath brought us forth out of Egypt, and behold, we are in Kadesh, in a city in the uttermost part, in the uttermost of thy border. So here we have in verses, latter part of verse 14 to verse 16, it's a statement of the history, historical setting and the present circumstances. And you look at this report and say, you know, that, that's a pretty good assessment of what transpired in Israel's history. But I'm going to submit to you that there may be more going on here, especially in the absence of God telling him what to say and then him obeying and saying it. And this is directly after the context where Moses rebelled, and we still do not see a repentance on the part of Moses and Aaron. We don't see that remedied at this point. So what I suspect is that Moses is acting basically out of his relationship and trying to do this on his own because this should not have been an issue at all to the children of Israel. And if indeed they d denied them passage through Edom, God, how do you turn down an almighty God? I mean, if he, if he delivered them out of the hands of the Egyptians and then later the Amalekites, how in the world would he not deliver them out of the Edomites? Well... So you have that historical setting and present circumstance. I'll come back to that in a moment. But then you have a formal request in verse 17. Okay, now what's this all about? Here's the request. Let us pass, I pray thee, through thy country. Now notice the, how he's speaking here. This is your brother. This is your border. This is your country. So these are the, this is the formal request. We're asking safe passage through your country. And here are the stipulations offered. This is, again, a part of that diplomatic communication. It's in classic form. He said, We will not pass through the fields or through the vineyards, neither will we drink of the water of the wells. We will go by the king's highway. That's that finished road. And we will not turn to the right hand or to the left we will, until we have passed thy borders. In modern day language, we're going to take the bypass. Don't worry, we're not going to stop, we're not going to clog up traffic, we're not going to create all these problems and leave all the trash and things in your, in your territory. We're just going to pass through, and when we get to the other side, then we'll camp and do whatever we have to do. This was a classic thing. It was very common. It was commonly granted. There was no reason they were not an enemy of the Edomites. They were not a threat to the Edomites. 
But look at the response. And Edom said unto him, Thou shalt not pass by me, lest I come out against thee with a sword. Now folks, there's no diplomacy in that statement. There's no subtlety in that statement. He said, if you come through here, we're going to fight you. I mean, it's that abrupt, that, I mean, what in the, they are brothers. Nationally speaking, they are brothers. I want you to stop for a moment. Let me give you another picture. And this is, this is suggested by a couple of the commentaries that I read, and I, I tend to agree with it in context. It sounds like Moses was playing the God card. He was playing the God card. Because, you see, these nations, as he told, even arguing with the Lord, he says, you know, these nations are going to hear that you brought them out of Egypt and all these great things that you've done for Israel, and then if you kill them here in the desert, he's going to say God couldn't bring them in. How will they fear us? How will they fear you when we come into the land? And now Moses comes, and without consulting the Lord, apparently, he goes and he starts playing the God card. He says, you know, when they hear that the Lord delivered us, the Lord brought us this far, and here we are at their border, and we want passage, they, they dare not say no. If God's for us, how will they ever deny as I request? Well, they denied it. He says, you will not pass through. If you do, we're going to fight you. Well, they offer a second uh, negotiation. Verse 19, they're going to pay for it. And the children of Israel said, we will go by the highway. And, okay, now here he says, if I and my cattle drink of thy water, then I will pay for it. I will only, without doing anything else, go through on my feet. He says, okay, we're willing to pay for it. And also, charging a fee for them to have safe passage was not uncommon. There's often a tax for caravans and armies that went through on a finished highway like this. Well, the response is, he said, Thou shalt not go through. And Edom came out against him with much people and with a strong hand. He said, you're not going through and we're, we're here to show you. We're here to demonstrate for us. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through the border. Wherefore Israel turned and went from him. And the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, journeyed from Kadesh and came unto Mount Hor. What should have been such an easy situation turned into the first defeat in the effort to take over the promised land? What should have been a simple thing turned into a defeat and it discouraged the children of Israel. Well, and this comes later. You, you read that later in uh, Psalm 90. Also, you read it in uh, Deuteronomy as they recount this event. But what we see here is man trying to, apparently man trying to do things on his own reasoning and in man's way. What other nations did to negotiate things, they tried to do, and it did not work. Didn't work with the spies when they sent spies into the land. That was the idea of the whole congregation of Israel. They came to Moses and demanded it. And when Moses granted it, the Lord was angry with Moses. Deuteronomy 1 tells us that. And now they come to this, and this didn't go well. I want, let me show you a contrast, just so you know what I'm talking about. Turn the page to chapter 21, if you have to in your Bible. Look at verses 1 to 3. After they have gone around Edom, they come to Mount Hor. Now they're going, and look at verse 21. And when King Arad the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard tell that Israel came by the way of the spies, then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord. Now see, here they, t they turn to the Lord. Here they again acknowledge their need for God's help and intervention. And they vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them in their cities. And he called the name of that place Hormah. Now here is a, another city and a military might, probably greater than Edom. 
And they come out against them and they call upon the name of the Lord and the Lord grants their request and he gives them victory, utter victory. That's what should have happened over in Edom, but it did not. The Jacob and Esau relationship was still contentious and there was a problem. Now I'm going to suggest something here. Jacob, I believe, did wrong back in Genesis, especially when he told his brother, you go on ahead. His brother graciously came to him, met him, and graciously received him, wanted to show him hospitality. And he said, I'm coming. I'm going to just go slower. Don't leave anybody with us and don't you wait. Don't slow yourself down. We'll be there. And he never shows up. Sometimes we let things fester, don't we, in our relationships? Brothers in Christ, families. And rather than resolve conflicts and contentions, which, remember, when there's an offense, it breaks our fellowship. And rather than resolve them, we just let them, well, time will heal all wounds, right? Apparently not. 500 years and these two now nations, they're still holding a grudge against each other. That's why the Bible says, don't let the sun set upon your wrath. That's why the Bible says, when you have aught with your brother, you go to that brother and you restore that brother. So that your fellowship's not broken with him, because if it's broken with him, the Bible says it's broken with God. Now what happens when you go to that brother and he will not restore, won't hear you and restore fellowship with you? Well, you've done your part. You can't change that brother's heart. But you can do your part before the Lord. But I'd like to suggest that sometimes when we think, well, well, that'll resolve itself. Sometimes when there's an offense, Jacob had an offense with Esau, and he should have corrected that. But he never did, and Jacob seemed to be, all the way up to his death, even before he died, he made Joseph promise him, when I die, make sure, promise me that you will take my bones up and bury them with my father. Don't wait until God brings us back to the land. You do it immediately. And they did. Do you remember at the end of chapter 50 of Genesis when Joseph dies? What does he tell the children of Israel? Know of a surety that God is going to visit you. He's going to deliver you. And he's going to bring you into that promised land that he promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, only when you go, take my bones. And bury them with my fathers. No rush. When God visits you 400 years from now, you, that's when you take them. See, that's a contrast between Jacob and his son, Joseph. Jacob always seemed to be concerned about how things looked. What happened at Shechem. And then all the events that transpired, it always seemed to be how things looked for him. He struggled. Joseph was... A difference night and day is like a contrast from Jacob to Joseph. But you know, as you look at these relationships, sometimes you have to commit those things to the Lord. You do the right thing. And then let God work. And here we see a defeat. Now I believe part of this comes back to Moses and his rebellion in the earlier part of that chapter. And that brings us to the latter part, which is a closing, a first end to this part. The title of the message is Not I, But Christ. In Moses' situation in the early part of the chapter, it became Not Christ, But I. He drew attention away from what God was trying to do, and he blurred the, the typical picture that he was painting of Christ. And for that, Moses was, and Aaron both were punished. So what happens to... Aaron, look here with me at the end of chapter 20. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in Mount Hor, by the coast of the land of Edom, saying, Aaron shall be gathered unto his people, and he shall not enter the land which I have given to the children of Israel, because ye rebelled against my word at the water of Meribah. Said Aaron's not going in either. Both of you rebelled. Because remember when he said, speak to the rock, that is plural. He says, you and Aaron, you gather the people, you take the rod, you speak to the rock. Plural, you too speak to the rock. And so that both of them were accountable for the rebellion. 
And because you rebelled, Aaron's also not going in. So here's what you're going to do. Take Aaron and Eliezer, his son, and bring them up to Mount Hor, and strip Aaron of his garments, and put them upon Eliezer, his son, and Aaron shall be gathered unto his people. Now that phrase, gathered unto his people, you're going to see it used three times. And it's a phrase that's only used in the Pentateuch, and it's only used of the patriarchal fathers. It was used of, of Abraham, of Ishmael, which I, I hadn't noticed that, but that same phrase was used of Ishmael. The other son, not Isaac, the, the one, the child of promise, but Ishmael, that child of his lack of trust in God and lack of faith. But it was used of him and of Isaac and of Jacob. And it's used here of Aaron. And later it will be used of Moses. But it's only used here in the Pentateuch to be gathered unto your fathers. And it says, there he will be gathered unto his people and shall die there. Now I want you to put yourself in... Yes, sir. No, no, no. I'm just saying it was only used of these patriarchal fathers of the, of the uh, Israel, Israel, Israel nation. Why Ishmael, it was used of him, I don't know. It could just be a phrase that was used in the Pentateuch. The significance of it, I haven't gathered, but it, it is significant that it's only used there. And uh, only in the Pentateuch, not the rest of the Old Testament. So, but here's the, this, the thing about Moses. I want you to try to put yourself in his position. You're struggling. Your sister died early in the chapter. Then the lack of water, you're frustrated. You rebel against God. You attack the people. You strike the rock. And now you understand you will not enter the promised land. You, plural, you and Aaron. And now God tells you, you take Aaron. And you take Eliezer and you go up to the mount. And then you're going to strip him. What clothes is he talking about? Well, you remember that study on the tabernacle? And Dad brought that big chart showing the high priest's robe and garb and the headpiece. Now Moses was going to take him. It's interesting that this was not done at the tabernacle. But he took them up on a mountain. And he says, you're going to take each of those pieces of clothing that are sanctified. They are set apart for the high priest alone, and his, it's representative of his role in intercession for the 12 tribes. And you're going to take it from him, and you're going to put it on Eliezer. Now, this is the, that transition of the priesthood. It's going to be the preservation of that priesthood. It didn't end with Aaron when he died. It's preserved through his seed, Eliezer, and then on down. But notice also... Can you imagine what, what it was like to look in his brother's eyes? Go back to Exodus chapter 4 again. Remember the third objection he gave to God when God called him and says, But Lord, I, I'm a man of a slow tongue and slow of speech. I can't speak well. Before you talk to me, and even now I'm struggling, said, Lord, I, I'm not your man to, speak, to be your spokesperson. And God said, I will be with you. I'll be with your mouth. I will give you the abilities. And he insisted, and God gave him Aaron. If it were me, I'd probably be sitting here. I knew the Lord got angry with me back there, and God gave me that concession, not because that was his, his pl original plan, but that was because I insisted. And Aaron's been in trouble a few times. Remember back to the golden calf? That absolutely stupid response that he gave when Moses said, what's going on? He says, well, you know these people. Blamed it on them. And then he said, he said, we took all this up, we threw it in the fire, and poof, out pops this golden calf. Absolutely ridiculous. And you wonder, if they slew all those people that were involved in that idolatry, a few thousand were killed. The Levites helped them do it. Why was Aaron not killed? And we find that out in Deuteronomy. It says, Moses said, God would have killed you, but I prayed for you. And God spared Aaron. Again, in chapter 12, when he went along with Miriam in attacking Moses, there's an intercession that's made. But I can only imagine here at this point, 
Moses is the one to whom it is, it is ascribed, even though both of them were involved, both of them were commanded to speak to that rock. I wonder if Moses is feeling guilty. You know, if I had just trusted God and not insisted upon this, maybe Aaron wouldn't be in this situation right now. But the difficulty of Moses having to strip him of the... I, I picture a military man who's being stripped of his medals and of his rank and all this because of some shame that he has brought upon the uniform. But in doing this, I want you to look at this. And verse 28 says, And Moses stripped Aaron of his garments and put them on Eliezer his son. And look at the next verse. And Aaron died there on the top of the mount. Think about this. They went up to the mount in the presence of all the people. They must have asked, wondered, what's going on? Here Moses and Aaron and Eliezer. Usually Eliezer doesn't leave the tabernacle if Aaron's not there. But all three of them are going up to the mount. What's going on on the mount? They might have seen from a very long distance, but they... It was not done. It was not an act of humiliation to Aaron. And here's where, again, you see God's grace and mercy. He allowed Aaron to wear that high priest robe and all that clothing all the way up the mount. And there in the last moments of his life, he, he was able to serve in that role. God, God was not saying there's not forgiveness but he was saying there are consequences. And he allowed him, and his mercy was to not shame him in front of all the people. And he goes up, and there on the mount, in that privacy between God, Moses, Aaron, and Eliezer, the transfer of the priesthood is done. Here's another part of God's provision for this succession. Back in chapter 16, Korah, Datham and Abiram, they challenged Aaron's priesthood. Why can't we be priests too? Why is it only Aaron who's the high priest and his sons who are the priests? Why can't they, are we not all a priestly nation? A priestly tribe, the Levites, Korah was a Levite. Why aren't we up there with you? Well, God kind of eliminated all that nonsense that would happen if they had observed Aaron die, they mourned him, and then they transfer that he said, no, we're going to do it up here. When Moses and Eliezer come down the mount, it's done. There's nothing to fight over. So he kind of spared that family bickering that might have taken place as to who would step in and who would take over. God had a way of doing things. And, and this is kind of God, the Lord taking control of things again and kind of restoring Moses and Aaron back to himself. We finally see them again, or even in discipline, but you see God's care. And notice this. It says he died there on the top of the mountain. Moses and Eliezer came down from the mount. And when the congregation saw that Aaron was dead, they mourned for Aaron 30 days, even all the house of Israel. He went out with honors. In spite of his disobedience, it didn't cancel what he had done for the Lord. And we see... Yeah, tragic ending to a story, isn't it? But yet you see God's grace and mercy in the lives of these. These are accounts that you don't skip over when you're going through the Word of God. There are principles to be taught, principles to be learned. What can we learn from this? Number one, our anger should never take precedence over God and what God is doing. Number two, we do not misuse the things that God gives us. For example, that rod that was called the rod of God in, Gen in Exodus 4, verse 20. It was used for all those signs. It was now a holy, sacred rod. In fact, he had to go and take it from before the Lord. That means it was probably kept in the Holy of Holies or near there. But he misused it. You don't do that once something's committed to the Lord. And by the way, everyone who's born again... Their body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. We belong to him. We've been bought with a price. And our purpose, the verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 6, 9, of 6 says, Therefore glorify God with your body and spirit, which are God's. That is what we are created for. And the accusation God had against Moses and Aaron, you failed to sanctify me before the people. You publicly rebelled against me. 
in front of the people. And for that, you're not going in. Well, another thing we can learn from this is don't let your relationships go broken. Don't just kind of put it off, say, well, you know, I'm not going to go deal with it. I'm not going to deal with it. I'm just going to let it go. Because down the road, you don't know when. Things can come back and harm you. There can be consequences that will come back. So settle those things. Don't be a Jacob. And e a Jacob. Esau, I believe, did the right thing. Even though Esau was not known for being a godly man. But even as an ungodly man, he did the right thing. And Jacob refused to do what a Christian or a, someone who fears God should have done. So those are some lessons. Serve the Lord to the end, that latter part. At the Bema seat, we're not, we're not going to receive at the Bema seat it, all the, the negative things. We're going to receive rewards for what we have done for the Lord. Have we failed the Lord? I'm sure we have. I know I have. But we confess that and we continue serving and we trust God to do the right thing when it comes to the end. But serve the Lord to the end. Don't give up. Don't walk away. Serve the Lord till he's done with you and then trust him to give you the just reward because he's the righteous judge and he's keeping score and he will not make mistakes so take that read it and apply it as we get into chapter 21 the latter after we get to verse 3 we're going to get back to some more murmuring and one of those famous bible stories from childhood comes back and again another beautiful picture of the cross of christ We'll get into that next time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. and Lord, these accounts that are painful, even today, for us to look back. and For a man like Moses, this is one of the darkest chapters we see in his life. Exemplary in every way up until now, practically. But here, he just rebelled. And the price was great. And we see the sad ending. For Miriam and for Aaron. But Lord, we see also your mercy and grace. We see your faithfulness to your promises as in spite of the rebellion and the, the griping and murmuring of the children of Israel. You still brought them as you promised their fathers. You brought them into that promised land. We thank you for who you are. and Lord, I pray that we'd be reminded today that while the events we are, we're studying are some 3,500 years old. You're the same God and you change not. And we can trust you to keep your word today as you did then. You are as holy today as you were then and you expect of your people nothing less than you expected then. Help us, Lord, to live up to that which you would have us to be. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.